welcome to Grand Rounds again, everybody. Uh, um, I'm just gonna make a quick announcement. If you want to get continuing education credit, the code for today is 520, 520. So uh, text in 520 to the Cloud CME system. Uh, once you complete your evaluation, you'll get a certificate. If you need further instructions, they are typed into the chat function. But I am going to turn today's introduction over to Dr. David Russ Marin, and I'll have him, let him take it away. Thanks so much, Chris. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Today's presentation is at the tail end of Spiritual Care Month. And as many of you know, our wonderful, amazing chaplain, um, Reverend Angelica Zolfrank, has led numerous programs over the past few weeks around campus and has been uplifting us during what has been a very challenging time. I think we can all agree. Um, and uh, for this capstone on Spiritual Care Month, we have um, Professor Tyler J. Vanderweel. He's the John, J., John L. Loeb and Francis Lehman Loeb Professor in the Departments of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. He's also the director of a fascinating program at Harvard, the Human Flourishing Program, and I encourage you to check that out, as well as the co-director of the Initiative on Health, Religion, and Spirituality at Harvard University, also a fascinating program, which has both of them are on the web. Um, Dr. Vanderweel holds degrees from o University of Oxford, University of Pennsylvania, and Har Harvard University in mathematics, philosophy, theology, finance, and biostatistics, a rare combination. Uh, but even more rare is his methodological research and approach. And it's focused not only on methods for distinguishing between association and causation, but also theory and blending those two approaches in biomedical and social sciences, and also measurement theory, the importance of incorporating ideas from causal inference into, from analytic philosophy into measure development and evaluation. So really bringing together some very unique methods to tackle some of the big questions of our time. He's, his empirical research, it spans psychiatric and social uh, epidemiology, the science of happiness, the science of flourishing, and of course, the study of religion and health, which is why um, we invited him here. I, I invited him here. Um, he's the recipient of the 2017 President's Award for the Committee of Presidents and Statistical Societies, and has published over 300 papers in various peer reviewed journals, author of numerous books, and also a wonderful colleague and friend. And it is truly a pleasure and honor to introduce him without any further ado. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, David, and thank you all for participating uh, in, in today's Grand Rounds on, online. Um, I will be speaking today on some empirical research relating religious service attendance and mental health. And we'll be asking, looking at the evidence, is this really causal? And if so, what might the mechanisms be? Um, I will begin with some of the methodological challenges and trying to study this relationship between religious participation and health. And then we'll go on to review results from a number of empirical studies relating uh, religious service attendance to depression, uh, to suicide and to anxiety using data from the nurses health study and a number of other studies as well. Um, and then I'll conclude with some discussion of the implications of this research for public health um, and for clinical practice. Um, again, many of the analyses, but not all, come from the Nurses' Health Study data. Um, funding for this research comes from the John Templeton Foundation. Um, so ne nearly a century ago, uh, Freud, commenting on religion, uh, wrote, religion works by distorting the picture of the real world in delusional manner, by forcibly fixing adherents in a state of psychical infantilism, and by drawing them into a mass delusion. Um, about 40 years later, in the American Journal of, of Psychiatry, in a review of the work that had been done uh, to date on uh, religion and mental health, uh, Sunua wrote, the contention that religion as an institution has been instrumental in fostering general well-being is not supported by empirical data. There are no scientific studies which show that religion is capable of serving mental health. However, now five decades later, the evidence in fact does look rather different. However, before approaching that evidence, I do want to talk about some of the methodological challenges in trying to study this relationship. Uh, numerous studies over the past decades 
uh, have associated, for example, religious service attendance or other forms of religious and spiritual participation uh, with lower rates of depression. Um, in the second edition of Harold Koenig's Handbook on Religion and Health, notes that of 272 cross-sectional studies published since 2000, 63% of these suggested a protective association, only 6% a detrimental association. Of 45 cohort studies since, published since 2000, 47% suggested a protective association, only 11% a detrimental association. So at a sort of high level survey of, of this, it, it looks like religious participation is perhaps associated with lower depression. Um, but strikingly here, uh, the vast majority of these studies are in fact uh, cross-sectional. And, and this is potentially problematic because with cross-sectional data, we really don't know in what direction causal relationships might play out. Um, so for example, uh, a number of years ago, but Salco and colleagues using longitudinal data over time found evidence for an effect in the reverse direction. And they showed that among women, depression at age 18 uh, predicted lower levels of service attendance, religious service attendance subsequently, even controlling for baseline levels of service attendance. It looked like those who became depressed uh, were more likely to stop attending services. So there was evidence essentially for uh, reverse causation. We might observe an association cross-sectionally between religious service attendance and lower depression, not because religious service attendance is protecting against depression, but whether because those who become depressed stop attending services and also withdraw from other forms of social participation. And this effectively renders cross-sectional data useless for trying to study um, the evidence for a causal relationship, because again, the effects might go in both directions. However, there are a handful um, of well-designed large longitudinal studies with control for baseline depression, uh, which do still find uh, associations between uh, religious service attendance and subsequent lower depression. Again, controlling for baseline depression as well as just one of, of perhaps a handful of examples um, paper by Strawbridge et al. in 2001, which has subsequently received a fair bit of attention in the religion and health literature using a longitudinal study of about 2,700 participants uh, found that religious service attendance uh, weekly um, for those who were depressed at baseline increased the odds of depression recovery by about twofold. Um, but the analyses of Maselko et al. do make clear that cross-sectional data really shouldn't be used to uh, study these sorts of relationships and to attempt to assess evidence for causality and, and that there may in fact be evidence in both directions. And so in, in thinking about the methodological challenges with regard to this research, um, I, I think it's important to focus on questions of study design. And, and I think one can establish a certain hierarchy with regard to different types of study designs and their differing levels of robustness to potential confounding and reverse causation. Um, at the bottom of the, the, the hierarchy, the weakest sorts of designs are those which are cross-sectional. And again, it's very difficult at all to discern causal relationships with cross-sectional data. Um, the next best sort of study would be a, a longitudinal or cohort um, study, which made adjustment for, for various uh, demographic factors at baseline. Um, better yet still, and, and in my view, this is really the, the minimum bar for, for trying to provide evidence from observational studies for causal relationship one really does need to control for a baseline outcome. If we're looking at the effect of religious service attendance on uh, depression, at the very least, we do need to control for depression at baseline. Otherwise, we really have no way of trying to rule out reverse causation. Um, better yet still, uh, for reasons I will be describing shortly, are studies where we could control not just for um, past levels of depression, but also past levels of our exposure, religious service attendance, essentially looking at changes in religious service attendance over time and whether those changes are associated with um, subsequent outcomes, subsequent depression, say. Um, better yet still, uh, if we have uh, repeated measures on, on, on our outcome on depression over time and also on our exposure religious service attendance, uh, we can use more sophisticated methods for causal inference from longitudinal data to, uh, to assess effects. And of course, the gold standard for trying to assess causal relationships 
uh, is a randomized controlled trial. Of course, for most forms of religious and spiritual uh, par participation, this, this isn't feasible. And we are left with observational data and trying to uh, discern evidence for causality from observational data. So while one can't necessarily prove uh, causality from, from observational data alone, one can provide evidence. Um, but the strength of that evidence it does depend critically on the nature of the study design. And as I hope to show in uh, the remainder of this presentation, sometimes the evidence can in fact be quite strong. But too many of our studies uh, looking at the relationship between uh, religion and health and religion and mental health have been cross-sectional. And again, I think are not helpful for trying to assess evidence for causal inference. Um, so, so, I mean, another way to try to understand the necessity of these stronger study designs is, is if we found an association, say, between religious service attendance and our, our outcome, maybe depressive symptoms, um, even if there were no effect of attendance on depressive symptoms, if prior levels of depression affected both subsequent levels of depression and also um, subsequent levels of attendance, we'd find a protective association even though there was no effect of attendance on depression. And so to, to rule out this possibility, we again, we really do need to control for baseline levels of depression. Um, and that, that can in fact sometimes suffice to rule out reverse causation. It, it, it can do so if, um, uh, if it's not the case that sort of the whole trajectory of depressive symptoms uh, affect subsequent attendance and, and, and depression. If, if, if that does, then we really do need to control for, for data even further in the past, such as uh, sub, uh, prior levels of religious service attendance that can rule out the possibility that, that perhaps um, depression two periods back or two years back might affect uh, both attendance and um, and depressive symptoms. Controlling for prior levels of our exposure, prior levels of service attendance um, is also helpful from the perspective of causal inference because it can help rule out um, potential unmeasured confounding. Um, so, so for example, in some of these analyses looking at uh, religious service attendance and, and mental health, uh, there's no control made for, for, for personality factors, uh, the, the, the big five say. Um, and, and we know from prior evidence that uh, conscientiousness um, uh, and, and agreeableness are, are both associated with increased levels of attendance and uh, lower levels of depression. And so by not controlling for them, we might have confounding. Um, but if we control for past service attendance um, as well, then for such confounders to explain away our observed associations, they would need to be associated with current service attendance uh, substantially through pathways independent of, of past attendance. And, and that argument can be uh, more difficult to make. And, and so control for prior levels of service attendance can again help uh, better rule out the possibility of unmeasured confounding. Um, we can go even, even further than that. Um, and I, I, I've written a number of, of papers on, on even more advanced statistical methodology um, for, for, for time varying exposures for causal inference. I won't go into great uh, detail here, uh, but methods such as marginal structural models developed by Jamie Robbins at the uh, Harvard School of, of, of Public Health um, essentially allow for looking at whole trajectories of, of our exposure and, and our outcome over time to pr produce even stronger evidence. So these methods allow for feedback between uh, our exposure and our outcome, religious service attendance and depression. Um, and, and confounding control is done by, by weighting methods rather than regression. It's sort of, for those who are familiar with the techniques, it's sort of a generalization of propensity score methods uh, to a time varying uh, setting. And I, I'll be presenting um, some results from uh, these, these marginal structural models with regard to the, the cumulative effects of religious service attendance on depression, um, but also we'll be looking at the effects of depression on, on religious service attendance uh, over time. I'll also be presenting some more traditional analyses um, as well. Um, so again, there are difficult methodologic challenges here, but, but we can, um, with better study designs and, and better data and better analytic techniques, um, use even observational data, at least with, with longitudinal studies, to try to provide um, some evidence for causality. Uh, so I'll begin with depression and the analyses I'll be presenting on, um, on depression and, and depressive symptoms 
uh, make use of the, the nurses' health study data, large cohort study um, that's been run over a number of decades here at uh, Harvard. And starting in 1992, the nurses' health study one uh, began measuring religious service attendance um, every every four years. Uh, these analyses uh, uh, for uh, depression used uh, a cohort of about 48,000 uh, U.S. nurses, I mean age 58. Um, at baseline, service attendance was self-reported in 1992 and then every four years subsequently. Um, depression, when treated as a binary variable, was um, assessed either by, by self-report as being a self-report physician diagnosed clinical depression or self-report antidepressant use. Uh, and that was measured in 1992 and then again every four years thereafter. Uh, depressive symptoms were measured by the CSD scale um, uh, in 2004 and prior to the geriatric scaled in uh, 2008. Um, and then in, in these analyses, what I'll essentially be looking at is um, the effects of religious service attendance in 1996 and 2000 on subsequent depression, um, controlling for a rich set of, of covariates, um, as well as baseline depression and baseline religious service attendance in, in 1992. And again, uh, um, adjustment for confounding for this set of covariates I'll be describing is done by uh, a weighting technique, but results are fairly similar uh, with, with conventional regression uh, adjustment using, say, logistic or linear regression, say. Um, so here's, here's what we controlled for to try to, as best we could, rule out confounding, um, but I will come back to this point that with observational data, we're, we're never entirely sure. Um, but, but as potential confounders, we controlled for, when, when looking at religious service attendance in 1996 as our exposure, we controlled for uh, baseline depression um, in 1992, so prior levels of depression, um, and also prior levels of, of religious service attendance to, again, try to even better rule out reverse causation and residual confounding. Uh, we also controlled for a variety of demographic characteristics, age, race, geographic region, a bunch of socioeconomic characteristics, employment status, education level, husband's education level, uh, census tract income level, uh, number of social uh, characteristics, and a number of um, uh, physical health characteristics uh, as well in, in the right-hand column uh, along with health behaviors. Um, and, and in these uh, analyses, um, we looked at um, depression defined as the binary um, self-report outcome. Again, self-report finishing diagnose uh, depression or, um, or use of an antidepressant. And then we also looked at the um, CSD depression scale in, in 2004. And if you focus first on um, the bottom set of numbers where we're looking at religious service attendance in, in 2000 and the effects of that on um, depression or depressive symptoms in, in 2004, um, now what you'll see if, if we begin with the first set of, of, of numbers here is, is a, a, a dose response pattern with um, if we compare those never attending in 2000 to those attending less than once a week, once a week or more than once a week. Uh, for those who are attending more than once a week, uh, nearly a 30% uh, decrease in odds of, of incident depression in uh, 2004 confidence intervals um, given, given here. Uh, it, again, it looks like there's, there, there is evidence for, for an association and the dose response relationship, similar patterns uh, as well um, for, uh, for depressive symptoms. Um, however, if we look at the, at the um, top set of numbers, uh, uh, confidence intervals all include um, one, uh, and, 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 and so it doesn't look like religious service attendance in 1996 has an independent effect on depression in 2004 beyond the effect of, um, of, of attendance in, in 2000. It really seems, depression really seems to depend mostly on, on just uh, the, the, the most recent um, uh, levels of religious service attendance rather than the, rather than the past uh, trajectory. Um, we also ran similar analyses, reversing the exposure and, uh, and the outcome. So looking at the effects of depression on religious service attendance. Um, and there we find, uh, again, sort of replicating those analyses of Meselko et al, that um, those who were depressed in 2000 uh, were less likely to be attending services subsequently in, in 2004. Again, this is controlling for past service attendance as, as well, uh, about a 25% reduction in odds of, of service attendance for those who were 
depressed. Um, here we also found you know, potentially some evidence for, for a persistent effect of depression as well, where it looked like um, depression in 1996 decreased the odds, perhaps about 10% um, uh, of, of service attendance in 2004, above and beyond the effect of attendance in, uh, in, in 2000. Um, so, so perhaps a more persistent effect of, um, of depression on, on lowering attendance. But it, from these analyses, it does look like there are in fact effects in uh, both directions. Um, you know, one might wonder, uh, uh, do we really believe these analyses um, might, might, uh, might there be unmeasured confounding uh, that explains these, these away? This is obviously not randomized trial data. This is observational data. Um, and, and so uh, that is always a possibility and, and we need to acknowledge that with observational data. Um, but what we can do is we can try to assess how strong would such unmeasured confounding um, have to be to, to explain away uh, these, these effects. Um, so you know, I had noted earlier that um, uh, various aspects of, of personality are associated both with service attendance and with lower depression. Uh, the five personality factors, both conscientiousness and agreeableness, um, are, are associated with greater attendance, uh, lower depression. And so we might be concerned um, about unmeasured confounding by, by these uh, personality factors or, or, or by other variables that were un unmeasured. We tried to control for a rich set of um, social, demographic, economic, and health characteristics, but, but we never know whether we have, in fact, done an adequate job of that. And so what we can do is we can use sensitivity analysis techniques, which, which asks the question, how strong would associations have to be between an unmeasured factor and, and our exposure, religious service attendance, and, and our outcome, uh, depression, to explain away uh, the associations we've observed. Um, and there are a variety of, of techniques uh, to do this. Um, uh, a few years ago, I, I tried to introduce something that was very simple and, and easy to use, uh, which, which I referred to as the, the E value, a value related to the um, evidence that an association was in fact causal, that it was robust to confounding and, and proposed in this paper uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine that the E value in observational studies um, supplements the, the P value, the P values measure of evidence with regard to whether there is an association and the E value is a measure related to the evidence that that association is in fact robust to um, confounding. Uh, and this technique has um, become quite popular and it's caught on since its publication uh, three years ago. There have been over 800 um, uh, applications, published applications uh, of, of, of this that, 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 that cite uh, this paper. So we, we've tried to make this uh, technique really easy uh, to use. You can sort of do it with a um, hand calculator, or, or we, we have an online e-value calculator, which you can uh, access on my website. There are also um, Stata and, and R packages that, that do this um, automatically. But, but again, the, the question that's asked is, um, how strong would an unmeasured confounder have to be associated with the exposure and the outcome to explain away the, the observed associations? And, and if we apply this technique to these analyses on depression, what we get is that um, for an unmeasured confounder to explain our, our odds ratio estimate for um, religious service attendance, giving rise to um, an odds ratio of 0 0.71 for, for subsequent depression, uh, the unmeasured confounder would have to be associated with both increased service attendance and lower depression um, by 2.1 fold each above and beyond the measured covariates to, to explain this away. So this would be pretty strong Confounding, we, we have not controlled for, for conscientiousness or agreeableness, but you know, these variables are associated with service attendance and depression only by uh, odds ratios of about 1.3 uh, and not by, by, by 2.1. Um, so so you know, those personality factors may reduce our, our estimate somewhat, but are unlikely to completely be able to explain it away. Um, we can apply this technique to the, the lower, um, the, the limit of the confidence interval closest to the null as well, uh, which was uh, odds ratio of 0 0.82 in, in these analyses. And if we do that, um, we again still need an unmeasured confounder that was associated with a greater attendance and lower depression by, by uh, uh, risk ratios of 1.7 fold each, above and beyond everything else we've already controlled for to, to explain this away. So again, we can't be certain here, this is observational data, but it looks like pretty substantial confounding would be needed to explain away these associations. It looks like at least some of the association probably is causal. 
Um, so, so these results I've been presenting on religious service attendance and depression, and in some ways just confirm what was already reported in the literature, but, but do so with, with better study designs, repeated measures on both religious service attendance and depression with a, with a larger sample, about 50,000 women, and, and using methods that are explicitly designed to address the potential feedback. Um, and again, we did find evidence for uh, an effect of religious service attendance on, on reduced depression. Uh, but we also found uh, evidence for um, depression leading to uh, lower levels of, of attendance. And that reverse association um, arguably also has you know, at least as important practical um, implications. Uh, again, suggests those who become depressed are, are more likely to cease attendance, uh, which may exacerbate uh, depression yet, yet further. So I think it has interesting implications for, for religious communities, for example, that there may be a need to to, to, to try to identify individuals who are struggling and, and reach out uh, to offer support to such persons uh, before they, they leave and uh, perhaps exacerbating depression yet further. So again, I think these methods that uh, look at associations in both directions and that address these questions of, of feedback really can give important insight into the dynamics uh, relating religious service attendance and mental health. Um, so this is the set of analyses I'll spend the most time on. I'll, I'll also um, talk a, a bit about suicide and then talk a bit about the mechanisms there. Um, and then we'll, we'll um, more briefly uh, consider uh, associations with anxiety as well. Um, that many of the major world religions have uh, traditions prohibiting suicide. These are especially strong in Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, but, but um, Buddhist Taoist, Confucian, and Hindu traditions are also generally have descriptions against suicide, um, uh, and and so we might we might think uh, that we, we we perhaps would indeed uh, find that religious participation is is related to lower suicide levels. Um, I think these analyses with with suicide are also of of some interest because uh, one of the earliest uh, studies relating uh, religious participation uh, to to health. Uh, were those of, of, of Durkheim, uh, who looked at suicide rates comparing um, Catholic and Protestant and Jewish areas and, and found um, that uh, the, the rates were higher in, in Protestant areas. And, and when thinking about uh, the comparison with Catholic areas attributed this to uh, greater levels of social integration and control amongst Catholics. Um, so this was one of the earliest studies, but uh, Durkheim used group average data um, or, or ecologic data. And in some ways, this is even worse, even worse, weaker study design than, than cross-sectional uh, data. So the number of papers on the ecologic fallacy of trying to uh, draw individual level causal conclusions from, from group average data. So in, in some ways, um, the analyses I will be presenting a little bit later on um, we'll, we'll be revisiting Durkheim's uh, analyses, but using individual level uh, longitudinal cohort data. Um, so uh, the analyses uh, here likewise use uh, Nurses Health Study 1 uh, data, very similar uh, uh, design to um, what was employed with, with depression. Um, there are far fewer <laughs> suicide events, uh, thankfully. Uh, in, in the state, in fact, only only 36 uh, suicide events from um, 1996 through the end of follow up in, in 2012. Um, so we weren't really able to make use of the marginal structural model techniques and instead proceeded with a, a traditional proportional hazards model uh, with the nurses health study data, where again, we were taking uh, religious service attendance in 1996 as our primary exposure controlling for a rich set of covariates in 1992, along with uh, baseline de de depression and baseline uh, social support, as well as past levels of, of religious uh, service attendance. Uh, so we fit pr traditional proportional hazards models. Because there are so few events, we can run into modeling difficulties uh, with only 36 events. So additionally, um, as a sort of a sensitivity analysis, we use technique called exact uh, logistic regression, uh, which is better capable of handling fewer uh, events, but, but sort of with control for fewer covariates. So in that exact logistic regression model, we control just for uh, two potential confounders, the two we thought were, were potentially most important uh, uh, earlier 1992 levels of depression, baseline levels of depression, and, and also of, of social support. Um, but the estimates from these two models were, were in fact remarkably similar and, and suggested very large associations between religious service attendance and, and lower suicide uh, with the proportional hazards model 
our hazards ratio is 0 0.16, confidence interval 0.06 to 0.46, and with exactly just a progression, very similar odds ratio. Um, so this is this is like a five or six fold reduction in uh, suicide uh, rates uh, for those attending uh, services at, at least weekly. Um, so uh, one of the strongest protective factors I think known for um, for suicide. Um, and again, we can apply these sensitivity E value type uh, techniques to see how robust this might be to confounding and to explain away that hazards ratio of one point 0.16, a confounder that was associated with both attendance and reduced suicide by 12 fold, fold each above and beyond the measured covariance would suffice, but weaker confounding would not uh, to explain away that, that upper limit of the confidence interval of 0.46, an unmeasured confounder associated with a greater attendance and uh, reduced suicide by, by a 3.7 fold each would suffice, a weaker confounding would not. So really substantial confounding would be needed to explain away uh, these, these associations. Uh, at the time we, we published uh, this in, in 2016, um, there, there was a similar effect uh, estimate um, from a case control study. There was at the time only one um, a longitudinal study with completed suicide as outcome and other number of other studies with uh, suicide attempts or suicide ideation. Um, but that other study didn't control for, for baseline depression. So I think at the time of publication, this was, was arguably the strongest evidence for an association and arguably evidence that some of that association at least was, was causal. Uh, but quite a bit of evidence has accumulated in the, in the four years uh, since. And along with colleague Ying Chen, uh, we've published a, a review uh, of, um, of that uh, evidence in a book chapter in uh, uh, in, in David Rosemarin's uh, fine book with Harold Koenig on um, Handbook of Spirituality, Religion, and Men Mental Health. Um, and, uh, and, and also earlier uh, this year, we, we published another piece looking at um, using nurses' health study data too, so a slightly younger cohort of nurses and also um, the health professionals follow-up study. Uh, we looked at relations between religious service attendance and um, so-called deaths of despair, deaths due to um, suicide, but also uh, drug overdose and, and alcohol abuse uh, and, and, and similar associations there as well in both cohorts, slightly larger associations for, for women than for men uh, with, with, with suicide. Um, and the association, the protective associations in, in this study with uh, deaths due to um, drug and alcohol use uh, were, were, were uh, notably stronger with, with, with women than, than, than men, where it looked like they were, they were not with drug and uh, alcohol abuse, at least uh, deaths due to drug and alcohol use, whereas with suicide, it was present both with uh, men and women. Um, so again, the evidence has, I think, accumulated uh, substantially for um, an effect of religious service attendance on suicide over the uh, even four years since the publication of our, of our first study on this one. Um, we also looked at, at Catholic Protestant differences, and um, this was really the only comparison where we had sufficiently large uh, sample size to do uh, comparisons across different religious uh, traditions. Um, we, we've done this for uh, depression and for all-cause mortality and really found uh, no, no difference between the two suicides was one of the only outcomes where we did um, find a, a difference. And um, it was religious service attendance was protective for both Protestants and, and Catholics, but for uh, Protestants, uh, those attending uh, once a week or more uh, had a, a hazard ratio of 0 0.34. So, so again, about a threefold reduction. Um, but for Catholics, that hazard ratio is um, 0 0.05, so like a 20 fold reduction. So again, protective effect uh, for both, but uh, in our estimate was about seven fold larger effect for. Uh, for, for Catholics than, uh, than, than for Protestants. Uh, test for heterogeneity here, p-value of 0.05. So really kind of borderline hard to be certain uh, about this. Again, the uh, samples, the total number of suicide events is limited here. So a lot of uncertainty uh, in, in these estimates. Um, but in some ways, this was a confirmation, um, if you believe these results of, of Durkheim's um, findings, but now with, with individual uh, level data. Um, interestingly, for those not attending uh, services, there was really no difference between uh, Catholics and, and Protestants. And so this, this might um, yet further support Durkheim's hypothesis that it really requires communal participation, that notion of social cohesion, social control uh, for these effects of uh, religion uh, to, be, to be operative. 
Uh, we also looked at potential uh, mechanisms uh, here, and a fair bit of my methodologic work is on, on mediation analyses. How do we assess pathways? I have a whole book uh, on, on this topic. Uh, because of the limited number of, of suicide events, we, we weren't able to use some of the more sophisticated uh, methods in, in, in uh, this analysis. But what we did do to try to get a crude sense of um, mediation was we looked at the associations between religious service attendance in 1996 and subsequent suicide through 2012, um, adjusting for potential mediators in, um, in, in 2000, kind of subsequent to our, our exposure. And we considered as potential mediators, uh, social integration, alcohol consumption, uh, depressive symptoms, and, and all three. Um, and if we looked at those who were attending um, services uh, less than once a week compared to not at all. Uh, initial hazard ratio is pretty modest here, um, 0.85 with a pretty wide confidence interval. But as we adjusted for those potential mediators, it, uh, um, that, that estimate uh, was attenuated more and more towards uh, the null. Um, but interestingly, so, so you know, may, maybe these things are explaining some of the effect, but again, a lot of uncertainty uh, in those analyses. Uh, but interestingly, when we looked at uh, the associations with those attending uh, once a week or, or more, as we adjusted for the mediators, it, it really didn't change the effect estimate much. And, and so we were a little bit uh, surprised by this because we thought these were um, plausible mechanisms. And again, there's a lot of uncertainty here given the number of uh, limited number of suicide events. Um, but the fact that uh, these, these other mediators uh, didn't seem to explain much of this association made, made us sort of speculate whether uh, the primary mechanism uh, for, for the reduced effect might, might in fact be um, the belief that, that suicide itself uh, was, was wrong. Again, there's only indirect evidence uh, here that we, because we couldn't explain it away by these uh, seemingly plausible uh, mediators. So this certainly merits uh, further investigation, but it, it, it might be that those um, prescriptions against uh, suicide uh, held by the major world uh, religions are, are what in fact is exerting uh, this powerful effect, protective effect on suicide. Uh, as regards empirical analyses, I'd like to conclude uh, with uh, anxiety. Um, and uh, now here I would say the evidence is much more am ambiguous uh, in, in, in Harold Koenig's uh, handbook on, on religion and, and health um, of uh, 299 studies reviewed, uh, 147 of those, uh, including a bunch of cross-sectional studies. Um, mostly cross-sectional studies, uh, um, about 49% of those suggested that um, religious or spiritual participation was associated with, with less anxiety, uh, 33 studies, 11% uh, with, with greater anxiety, um, and nearly half uh, suggested no relation. Um, but unlike with, with depression and um, suicide, I think the more rigorous studies with, with anxiety, in, in, in fact, suggest no or, or only a very small effect of, of religious service attendance on, um, uh, on, on anxiety. Uh, several longitudinal studies, again, suggest little or no effect. And in, in the largest study to date, which we just published uh, earlier this year in the International uh, Journal of Epidemiology, which was um, using three separate cohorts at different uh, life stages, the Growing Up Today study for young adults, the Nurses Health Study 2 for middle-aged adults, and the Health and Retirement Study uh, for uh, older adults, a uh, total of 90,000 participants. When we combine the results across these uh, three studies, uh, the standardized effect size estimate was uh, minus 0.05, a confidence interval because we have a large sample size of minus 0.07 to minus 0.03. Um, but this is really, this is a 20th of a standard deviation. This is a, this is a really tiny um, effect. Um, and, and so when, when I presented these analyses, uh, I think a, a number of people have been surprised. I mean, some people think, well, if, uh, if religion's doing anything for mental health, surely it's kind of bringing some sort of sense of peace, it's relieving anxiety. And my speculation, this is, I don't have data on this yet, but, but, but so this is speculative. Um, my, my speculation is that it, it probably does operate in that way for some, uh, but perhaps for others, it increases anxiety, it creates an additional set of, of commitments, of, um, of obligations, or, or if one has a sense of, of failing to live up to um, the standards when one wants to do so, that might likewise uh, create 
uh, anxiety or, or, or even the additional set of um, commitments in terms of the time might do so uh, as, as well. So, so my speculation is it does give considerable peace to some, but it creates anxiety for others. And it, it looks like uh, from these analyses in, in the United States, at least on average, that net effect of religious service attendance on, on anxiety seems to be pretty small uh, in, in contrast with what we find for, for depression and suicide. Um, so I, I focused here on, on, uh, on mental health, um, but uh, other analyses have looked at you know, a wide range of, um, of, of outcomes and suggest that participation in, in religious community, and it really does seem to be religious service attendance that's, uh, that's driving this, and I'm happy to talk about that more during the, the Q&A, but um, it, it really does seem as though weekly religious service attendance has pretty profound effects on a wide range of outcomes, including you know, reduced all-cause mortality over a 15-year stretch, higher life satisfaction, higher levels of subsequent meaning and purpose, uh, notably less uh, substance uh, uh, abuse, uh, lower levels of, of crime, greater uh, relationship satisfaction and, and marital stability, lower levels of um, subsequent divorce um, and greater levels of generosity, volunteering, civic engagement, and, and, and pro-social uh, behavior. And again, it does seem to be service attendance rather than private practice or affiliation um, or self-assessed religiosity or spirituality that has the strongest associations, at least in the general population with these, with these outcomes. Uh, I think associations are uh, more complex with, with uh, clinically ill populations, but with the general population, it does seem to be service attendance that most strongly is driving these various outcomes. Uh, so in the final 10 minutes uh, or, or so before we move to questions and, and discussion, I'd like to briefly touch on uh, some of the implications uh, of, of this research as concerns um, research designs, uh, um, then as concerns public health and finally uh, clinical practice. Um, and, and from the research uh, perspective, I, I think hopefully what I've made clear in the discussion of the methodologic challenges is we really do need longitudinal designs to provide evidence for um, effects of causality of uh, religious participation on, on health. Too many of our analyses use uh, cross-sectional data um, for service attendance and life satisfaction, for example, in literature review I did in 2017, it looked like over 99% of analyses were relying on cross-sectional data. And again, whenever effects can be in both directions, this really is uh, problematic. Um, and, and so I think we need to take this seriously. Um, we need to try to focus on making use of or, or collecting longitudinal uh, data over, over time. Um, and I, I, I think uh, for, for for, for relationships where um, we already have some evidence base, I think journals should start uh, rejecting cross-sectional uh, analyses. If it's kind of the first analysis uh, with cross-sectional data, it can be intriguing with regard to, to generating hypotheses. But if that already exists, then we really do need to focus on longitudinal designs to increase the evidence uh, base. Um, and I likewise think cross-sectional studies really should be bracketed out of um, more rigorous systematic reviews, and those should should focus on uh, longitudinal designs with control for, for baseline outcome. And, and this now exists in the religion and health literature for, for mortality and, and, and uh, the paper just published this year for uh, mental health as, as well, depression and anxiety. Um, so I, I think right now the evidence base comes from too few uh, rigorous longitudinal studies and this really does need to change. Uh, it, it, it has been, and I think we're in a much better position now than we were five or 10 years ago, uh, but I, I do think this is a really important methodologic point. Um, for religion and health, but, but, but also with regard to um, observational analyses uh, of data related to mental health more generally. Uh, with regard to kind of public health implications, I, I really do think we need to start thinking about religious service attendance as one of the critical um, social determinants of health, so, along with economic status and, and, and race and, and gender that really does play um, an important role. Um, and, and just one way to see this, um, now we often in public health think about public health impact as a function of two things, that the prevalence of the exposure that we're studying and, and the size of its effects. If we have something that's common and has large effects on the outcomes that we care about, um, then it's going to shape uh, population health. Um, with regard to religious service attendance, participation uh, both in this country and worldwide is common. Approximately 84% of the world's population report a religious affiliation. Within the United States, 89% uh, believe in God, 78% consider 
religion a very important or fairly important part of life. 79% identify with a particular religious group. Um, and in 2016, though this has come down somewhat since, 36% uh, report having attended a religious service attendance in, in the last week. Um, moreover, we've seen that at least for depression and, and suicide, we have a relatively large uh, effect. So I, again, I think religious service attendance really is an important uh, social determinant of, of health and should be included in, in discussions and in, in curricula uh, with regard to what is shaping population mental health. Um, you know, as yet another example illustrating this um, and the potentially public, important public health implications, uh, the CDC released a report expressing concern about increased rates in, in suicide. And in, in this particular report, an increase from 10.4 per 100,000 per year in 1999 to 13 per 100,000 per year in 2014. Um, during the same period, the Gallup poll indicated a decline in uh, weekly religious service attendance from 43% in 1999 to just 36% in 2014. And if you were to take the results of our study and the nurses' health data um, and extrapolate them to the US population, and that is a jump, that is an extrapolation, um, but if, if one were to do so, if one were to take that effect estimate and extrapolate it, it would indicate that about 40% of the increase in suicide rates between 1999 and 2014 was in fact due to the decline in religious service attendance. So again, we need to take these trends in religious service attendance into account when thinking about uh, the trends in mental health outcomes. To not do so is really to turn a blind eye to one of the major forces that's shaping mental health in this country and worldwide. Perhaps more, more complex and, and, and contentious and, and, and subtle are you know, what, what might the clinical implications of, of this work uh, be. And um, you know, the, the, there was a, a pretty, um, I think powerful piece in, in published in 2000 in the New England Journal of Medicine by Richard Sloan and colleagues entitled, uh, Should Physicians Prescribe uh, Religious uh, Service Attendance? And, and sort of the uh, title was intended to be uh, ironic, and, um, and, but they, they make a powerful case that sort of endorsement of service attendance is premature and, and unethical. Uh, religion can also cause tensions and antagonism um, it's really difficult for clinicians to practically address this because religious views differ. They're not trained to do so. Um, and they, they argue these matters shouldn't be discussed in the clinical context. Um, Harold Koenig and a number of others uh, responded uh, to this piece and um, you know, argued, um, I think reasonably, that the, the Sloan et al. commentary was, was essentially setting up a, a, a straw man and, and, and knocking it down, that, that no one was really arguing that and physicians should prescribe uh, religious activities, but that's very different than uh, recognition that the activities may be important in a patient's life and shape their understanding of, of illness and provide um, a source of, of support. Um, and, and sort of pointing out that you know, current recommendations are to take a brief spiritual history. Um, and, and for those who are not religious, the, the discussion can, can quickly move on. Um, and, and another response to, to this piece, um, more anecdotal physician David Nicklin wrote um, as, 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 as follows, um, that, that his experience uh, could hardly be more in conflict with the conclusions of, of Sloan et al. Although I do not routinely inquire about patients' religious or spiritual lives, it is not unusual for me to do so. Most frequently I ask such a question when patients are suffering from progressive, incurable, or fatal illness. It also seems relevant to inquire when patients are struggling with mental anguish or addiction. It's my practice to ask patients whether spirituality or religion is important in their lives. I then listen respectfully to their experience. Some patients report little engagement with these matters and go on to discuss other subjects. Many patients talk of the central part God plays in their lives and in their experience of illness. Some describe the comfort and support they obtain from religious and spiritual sources. And I, I validate this response and encourage them. Some say they have lost touch with religion and spirituality and wish to reconnect with them. And we discuss that. We then go on to the issues of diagnosis and treatment. I have had many hundreds of such conversations and not a single patient has responded negatively. The information informs my approach to patients in discussing their illness and their medical choices, sometimes in important ways. I come to know my patients in a deeper way and they feel seen and heard in ways that matter to them. This approach helps me treat them and heal them, particularly when they are facing incurable illness or death. So I, I do think there is an important role for religion and spirituality, um, even in clinical practice. Um, I do think one needs to be careful um, 
Um, but I, I think even with regard to questions of participation in religious community, when done appropriately, um, this could be brought in uh, to clinical care and to psychiatric care. Um, I certainly don't think there should be any sort of uh, universal prescription uh, for, for religious service attendant. People don't make decisions about religion based on, on health. You know, these beliefs and commitments rather are shaped by our experiences and upbringing values, truth claims, systems of meaning, evidence, relationships, and, and, and so on. Um, but for those who um, already positively self-identify with a particular religious tradition, um, it doesn't seem un un unethical or wrong to raise uh, the question of whether they might want to consider engaging with a community um, uh, who, 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 for which they already share uh, those beliefs as a meaningful form of social participation. Again, the effects on um, health and on many other outcomes do seem to be uh, profound. Uh, I do think care needs to be taken. Context is important. Um, situations of prior abuse need to be handled carefully and, and, and addressed. Um, I, I think this can be done in part by, by again, taking uh, a brief spiritual history. Harold Koenig proposes the, the following four um, questions, which might be seen to be you know, too many for um, a, you know, a limited clinical time, but I, th I think these could be simplified and reduced yet further. I think in almost any clinical encounter, one could ask, is spirituality or religion important to you now or in the past? Or, or do you have someone to talk to or would you like someone to talk to about spiritual matters? These are relatively neutral questions. The clinician and the patient don't need to share the same set of religious beliefs and then a referral can be made if the patient wants to discuss uh, further. Um, and again, for those who positively identify with a religious uh, tradition, uh, I, I think attendance in a uh, religious community could be encouraged as a meaningful form of social participation. For those who don't identify with a religious tradition, other forms of community participation um, could be encouraged. And again, for those who perhaps have experienced abuse, referral could be made for uh, further care. Um, palliative care guidelines suggest that this is critical. I think it's important in clinical practice and in psychiatric care more generally. Uh, religion can be a, an important protective, supportive resource, but it can also be the, the, the cause of, of psychiatric difficulty. So I think um, uncovering these issues and the role uh, they, they have in patients' lives is important. Uh, one study suggested that, that patients uh, consider religion and spirituality second most important of various factors in their own medical decision-making. Clinicians rated them, physicians rated them seventh out of um, seven. Uh, so I, I do think done sensitively and carefully, um, these issues can be brought into clinical practice. Um, I think we could also turn the question around um, and, and kind of given the evidence for the effects of religious service attendance on so many um, important health and well-being outcomes, we could ask if we will withhold this information, are, are we in fact doing harm? That concludes my presentation. Thank you for attending and happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Vanderbilt. That was a um, really uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation um, with a lot of interesting data and so statistics and information and um, uh, so a lot to think about. I think um, one person, uh, I think you asked the question about, um, uh, which I think you covered already in terms of your clinical um, recommendations. Um, but this person asks, given the strength of the data, um, what's your hypothesis as to why clinicians typically don't explore and encourage patients um, to attend church if they might benefit? Um, this person asks specifically about substance use disorders, but I'll broaden it, you know, suicidal patients, uh, patients struggling with chronic mental illness. Um, what are the barriers to getting more clinicians to actually have these conversations and uh, not necessarily prescribe it, as you kind of mentioned, but you know, if patients are open to it, is a way to socialize, is a way to maybe give more meaning and purpose, uh, all sorts of the benefits that you kind of alluded to. Yeah, um, I think it's a very good good question, and and I do think there are a number of uh, real barriers. Um, uh, I, I think some of it is feelings of, of discomfort at addressing these um, sensitive and, and personal um, matters. Obviously, more of that does take place in, uh, in, in psychiatric care than in many other areas of, of medicine. 
Um, I think there are also concerns about you know, the patient and the clinician not, not sharing the same set of, of um, uh, religious beliefs um, and, and how is the dynamic going to, to, to play out there. Um, I, I think another real concern is the sort of lack of, of training and, and how to do this, overstepping um, bounds, misuse of authority. So there, there are real uh, concerns and, and I think it is important to address those in, in a sensible um, manner. Again, I think sort of the relatively neutral questions that I had suggested earlier, is spirituality or religion important to you now or in the past? And do you have someone to talk to or do you like someone to talk to about spiritual matters? And I, I think these neutral questions can, can help um, in a very simple way uh, overcome some of, uh, uh, of those, those difficulties. And, and if the clinician doesn't feel comfortable, again, a, a referral uh, uh, can be made, but if someone does positively uh, identify with a particular religious tradition, I think one could go on to inquire further. Oh, do you participate in a community? And if not, uh, why not? Uh, or or would, you, would you be interested? Might you consider given um, some, of these, uh, some of these benefits? Um, and, and one study we've carried out, and this was with um, end of life care rather than um, psychiatric care, uh, when looking at different barriers, the, the, the most strongly uh, predictive factor with regard to uh, would a clinician engage in these conversations? And again, in, in end of life care, palliative care, this is it's considered best practice to do so, um, but, but most don't. Uh, but the most strongly uh, predictive factor was, um, had you received training uh, to do so? And, um, and the vast majority um, of, of um, palliative care uh, physicians had, had, had not. Um, so I, you know, I think this could be brought into the, the curriculum. Again, not doesn't need to be extensive. I think a session or two on how to sensitively ask questions, a bit of a review of the evidence, and then um, how, how to appropriately make a referral. I, I think that's all one would really need, but I think having that uh, training embedded in uh, a curriculum could, could go um, a long way. Great. The, um, I think that's really helpful. The, the next question I've got is, um, are there any situations that you've explored or researched or others have looked at in which um, specific types of people might actually be adversely affected by uh, attendance to at least specific types of religious services? So the example that I have in mind are LGBTQ youth um, attending a very fundamentalist uh, religious service and uh, we know that they have extremely high rates of suicide attempts and completed suicides. They also have much higher rates of mental health problems, including substance use disorders, depression, anxiety. And many of them, at least anecdotally, will say, because I feel like I'm going to burn in hell and I've been taught that I'm an evil person, I'm a bad person. Um, so what do we know about adverse effects of attend, uh, you know, attending religious services on certain populations? Yeah, so, so I mean, I would say that's still um, an emerging area of, of research, and um, many of the studies looking at this to date have, have been cross-sectional, but there, there, there are now emerging <laughs> more rigorous longitudinal studies as, as well. Um, and I would say the evidence to date looks, uh, looks mixed, that, um, that uh, religious service attendance clearly does seem to be harmful for, for certain LGBTQ populations. Um, and it seems to be protective for, for others. And probably a lot of that does have to do with the sort of um, religious service that, 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 they're, um, that they're attending. Um, so I, I, I think the sort of next frontier on, on research with regard to these questions is, is to try to better understand um, how, how the context um, matters, the sort of characteristics of the individual or, or of the um, particular community and how those relate to one another. Um, but I, I think the evidence to date suggests considerable heterogeneity um, there. Uh, and, and it sort of plays out similarly in, in, in earlier research with, um, uh, with, with, with uh, populations with H HIV. Um, uh, kind of one observes protective effects in certain settings and harmful effects in, in, in others. And so I think more work uh, is required to understand that better. Uh, another setting where, um, and this is just with cross-sectional uh, data, but I think it does uh, make some sense, but where one observes uh, effects in the, in the re reverse, the harmful direction is with um, unwed mothers attending religious services that, that's often associated, at least cross-sectionally, 
um, with, with higher rates of, of depression. Um, and you know, likewise, I, I think these analyses are important also for religious communities to kind of understand uh, these dynamics and, and to think about um, what sorts of efforts can, can be made uh, to, to, to offer uh, support uh, to, to, to these more, more vulnerable populations as, as well. So you know, I, th I think trying to understand this better really is uh, another important aspect of the research. Great. I, I'm mindful of the time. We're just a little bit over the hour. Do you have time for one more question? Sure. sure. All right, okay. So um, the last one uh, asks, can, can we tease apart um, the, the aspects of believing um, in God and believing in, um, you know, kind of the religious uh, kind of, um, I'm, I'm babbling now, but um, basically, can we tease apart, um, well, let me just read this person. So a person might attend services each week, but not be a believer. And um, might some of the health effects be due to religious beliefs or maybe non-religious moral beliefs or moral behaviors? And uh, to cut to the chase, is there any data um, looking at the health effects of attending religious services versus some other type of an organization, maybe Boy Scouts, maybe a community meeting, something else that might result in similar health benefits, but it's really more about, about the social aspects as opposed to the religious or moral beliefs. Sorry for that. Yeah, no, that's a good, good and important question. Um, so I'd say here's what we know and what we don't know. Um, there have, in fact, been very, very few um, studies of religious beliefs themselves that are longitudinal on, on health outcomes. So it's, it's, you know, it's one of the, I would say, open uh, questions, um, uh, the sort of intriguing cross-sectional data with regard to belief in life after death and, and generally better mental health, but really hard to know how, how, robust, uh, how robust that is. Uh, what we do know is that for the general population, um, religious service attendance is much more strongly associated with both mental and physical health than is private practices, just um, you know, self-assessed spirituality or, um, or, 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 or prayer or um, scripture reading practices. There is something uh, really important and powerful about the uh, communal aspect. Um, if you look at associations with participation in other forms of community life, you likewise find a protective effect on, on health the associations are, are not as strong as what one finds with religious service attendance, but they, they are still important and, and meaningful. Other, other forms of uh, social participation do matter. Uh, and the nurses' health study data, both with regard to all-cause mortality and also with regard to suicide, however, um, religious service attendance was the most uh, strongest association with, um, with uh, all-cause mortality and suicide. It was stronger than uh, marital status, uh, social group participation, time spent with friends, time spent with family, and even the co-composite of those other uh, uh, four social variables. So you, you do find an association with other forms of social participation, but it's not as strong as with um, religious service attendance. So they're trying to pull all of that together. What it, what it looks like is that that communal element really is uh, important in, in the religious private practices don't have the same effects. Um, but it's also that social element within religious communities even more important um, and even has stronger effects than other forms of social participation. So I, I tend to think it's what's giving you know, religious service attendance these strong effects is the coming together of the religious and the social. It's, it's, it's having that community, but it's not just any community, it's one uh, with a shared set of beliefs, of, of values, of, of, of mission, um, and, and, and purpose of, of, of understanding uh, the world where there's this um, mutual uh, reinforcement and care for one another shaped by um, a particular vision of the, of the end of life and God or the transcendent. And, and that coming together of, of the, the re religious and these values with the social context um, is really what uh, gives rise to these, to these powerful effects. Great. Hey. So with that, we will stop. Um, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank you so much. This was a great um, presentation and really stimulating discussion. So thank you so much. And uh, I think we will see everybody next week. Thank you all. It was a pleasure being with you today.